Whew. Amen. You know, God gave us a theme at the beginning of the year, and that theme is growth. And growth means... It means to sprout, to build up, to surge, to boost, to swell, to extend. It means increase, augmentation. It means flourish. It means earnings and gain, expansion and inflation, multiplication and output. It means to advance. So I pray in the name of Jesus that we realize that these words, these synonyms for growth have life, have breath, have strength. I pray that we adopt these words as our own and allow the Holy Spirit to take us to the next level and the next level and the next level. That we will be a light to a dead and dying generation in Jesus' name. Amen. Also, God gave us a theme scripture to go with the word growth for this year. And that theme scripture is found in Colossians chapter 2, verse 7. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith, then, then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. So as Pastor Lane was saying earlier, growth means to mature. It means to increase in size. It means to increase in number and it means to increase in strength. So we pray that as we uh, study this topic throughout the entire year, that you will increase in strength, size, uh, value, and that you will just mature in the Lord throughout this entire year, that you will look back and not only will, you, will others see your growth, but you will see your growth also. Today we're gonna to be coming out of Colossians, talking, um, not Colossians, uh, Philippians, talking about someone who had a growth experience. Mm. And it doesn't matter. Now, we're, we're going to be talking about Paul today and his growth experience. And the reason I want to deal with this one is because uh, Paul had his growth experience later on in life. And many of us, we will have a growth experience later on in life once we change our value of what we truly believe in. So for that, we're coming out of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Everybody okay this morning? Yes, sir. Philippians chapter 3. And when we get to Philippians, I actually want to start at verse 2. Yeah. Beware of dogs. Now that's just right there. Let's just, let's just. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he must trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law. A Pharisee. Concerning zeal. Persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. So we see here in this text in Philippians, Paul is addressing the Philippian church. And the first thing that he tells them, well, first of all, he tells them to rejoice. That's in verse one, he tells them to rejoice. And immediately after telling them to rejoice, he gives them three groups of people Jesus. to be aware of. And he starts it off by, first off by saying, beware of dogs, dogs right? Beware of dogs. And by the way, Paul is writing this letter from oh prison. He's incarcerated. So the first thing he says in his letter is to rejoice. And then also from this prison cell, I must warn you to beware of dogs. In the easy read, it says, be careful of the dogs. Those men who work, whose work does only harm Mm -hmm. They want to cut on everyone who isn't circumcised. Mm -hmm. So he says, beware of dogs. That's the first group. The second group, he says, beware of evil workers. And the third group he tells us to beware of is beware of what? Mutators, those who cut the flesh, those who mutilize themselves, right? Now, before we get too far in it, he, he also comes back in verse 3. Let's read verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, it, you have to stay with Paul because he, his writing is very 
he, he becomes very intellectual in his writing here. First of all, he tells us to beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and to beware of those who cut their flesh. And then he turns around and says, but we are the circumcised, right? So wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? You told us to beware of people who cut their flesh, and then you turn around and tell us that we are the circumcised. But he tells us who we are also. He says that we are worshipers, we worship God in spirit, we rejoice in Christ, and we put no confidence in our flesh. So who are these dogs that Paul oh, is talking about? He's talking about leaders in the church. Uh, my Lord. He's talking about the Judaizers, right? And if you study this text, Paul is giving his conversion story here. He is really, this is his testimony of who he was. He was a Jew of the Jews and a Pharisee of the Pharisee. So in, t in essence, he's telling us to beware of people just like me. Yes. This is exciting to me. <laughs> he said, be aware of people who were just like me. Those who were high and mighty. See, you have to understand that Paul was considered a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I mean. That means that not only did he keep the law, but he lived the law. The law made up his entire being. He was considered a Jew of the Jews. Whenever you look at Paul's pedigree, and when you think of the church, he was high in the church. He was so high in the church that he went to the uh, Sanhedrin and asked for permission to chase the Christians all the way to Samaria. I mean, he said, just give me some papers to go outside of our boundaries because I want to kill every last one of these people, right? And now he turns around in Philippians after he has had his Damascus Road experience, and the first thing he says is, beware, beware. of dogs. Beware of dogs. I want to read his pedigree from verse, uh, in verses 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. I think that this, this is huge. From the easy read, I was circumcised, like he's telling you, let me just tell you what I was. I was circumcised on the eighth day after my birth. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. I am a true Jew, and so were my parents. The law was very important to me. That's why I became a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. I was so eager to defend my religion that I persecuted the church, and no one could find fault with the way I obeyed the law of Moses. Mm. He was so into the church at, a, at an early age, when it came time to stone Stephen, he was too young to cast stones, but he wanted to participate so bad, he said, give me your garments. Let me hold your garments as you cast the stones. Now he turns around and says, beware of dogs. Beware of people like me. What he is saying that there are some of us, we are so dogmatic in the way that we think that we, it, it takes Christ for us to have a true conversion in our life. Jesus. You really don't want God to knock you down to get your attention. And he says, I want to look at verse 3 again. For we are the circumcision which worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now, when he says that we are the circumcision, remember, he says, be aware of those who cut the flesh, right? So what Paul is saying is that there are those who are circumcised, but there are those who cut the flesh. When he says that we are the circumcision, the difference in, in this word is, if you look at the word, the difference is one is to cut in two to make two pieces, and one is to cut a round to make a circular. So what Paul is saying is that there are those who cut in two pieces. They are just cut in two pieces, but then there are those who are cut around, right? And he's saying that we are the ones who have been cut around. Therefore, we are truly the worshipers of God. But then he says, but wait a minute. We still put no confidence in, in this flesh. flesh. And when he says we put no confidence in this flesh, he was not only talking about the flesh that was cut away from him, he's also talking about the flesh that, learned, that earned him his pedigree that Pastor Lane read earlier. So he says put no confidence in your own ability. Because if anyone could have put confidence in their ability, it would have been me. Because I was a Jew of Jews and a Pharisee of Pharisees. Now we want to drop down to verse 7. 
But what things were gained to me, those I counted or considered lost for Christ. So again, after he read his pedigree, he says that everything that I considered that was gained to me, remember growth, gain, everything that was gained to me, I now count it as loss. The very thing that I thought was an asset, I now see it was a loss. The very thing I thought it was in the plus column, I now see it's in the minus column. The very thing that I worked so hard to achieve, now I realize that I just wasted my time. Before Paul became a Christian, he thought that his success was holding to his faith and doing everything according to the letter of the law. Now, this is before Paul became a Christian. Now that he is a Christian, he, now he's facing those who are Judaizers, those who still want to have their foot in, in God and their foot in the law at the same time. And Paul said those type of people are dogs in their mind. You cannot worry about keeping the law because Christ became the law within himself. So what Paul is saying is that you can't keep your traditions, you can't keep your superstitions, you can't keep all that stuff and then try to serve Lord at the same time. He is saying that those are the type of people who are cut in two. They're not truly circumcised, they're just cut in two pieces. You're trying to be here and you're trying to be there at the same time. Are you with oh, us? Oh, Lord Jesus. Lord, Look at verse mercy. 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Why? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So he gives us some insight as to why everything that he did before Christ is lost. He said, it's lost because I did not have the knowledge of Christ. Every achievement that we do without the knowledge of Christ in our life is lost. You know, I've talked to many people who, who, who they want an education, they want a degree, and they want to be a doctor, a lawyer, you name it, right? So they do everything in their power to make sure that happens. And then when they accept Christ into their life, they realize that that was never their calling in the first place. Now you're, now you're faced with a choice. Do you continue to do what you want to do outside of God's will? Or do you listen to the calling of God and do what he wants you to do in his will? So Paul said, listen, God. a Jew among the Jews, a Pharisee among the Pharisees, I basically had a seat on the Sanhedrin council, but all that stuff is rubbish. I count it as lost. He says I count it as dung. dung. What is dung? Dung refers to things worthless and detestable. Yo, can we just talk? Who cares about your assets if they're not being used to glorify God? Who cares if you have a huge house with five bedrooms, but you won't let anybody come and get rest? Who cares if you can buy food and if you have all this stuff, if you're not going to share it with anybody? Who cares? Who cares? That's what he's saying. Who cares if you have three of this education and five of this and eight of this, if you're not going to use it for Christ? Who cares if you wrote a song and you got eight songs on the, on the CD if it's not for Christ? Who cares if you make eight figures and you can't give 10% to God? Who cares if you own a jet and you won't fly anybody, if you won't fly food to Africa? Who cares if you got name brand something, 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 if you know that a brother or a sister is in need and you won't give it to them. Who cares? Dung refers to things worthless and detestable. Mm. Rubbish refers to human excrement. Human success is like a big pile of excrement. I want to say it like Paul said it so bad. <laughs> you hear me? I want to say it like Paul said it so bad. Human success is like a big pile of excrement. Every standard of human success was viewed as so much excrement by Paul. 
See, when he said it in the, in the Bible, he said it just like how it would make you feel like, oh, they cussing on the pulpit. This is a very vivid portrayal. Yes. This is a very vivid portrayal that attempts to compete with the knowledge of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then Paul warns us, as he did in verse 2, be aware of dogs. Be aware of people who only want to know your pedigree. And whenever we look at dogs, the first thing we want to know about a dog is what is their pedigree. So a dog wants to know another dog's oh my pedigree. God. That's why dogs sniff around other dogs. What's your pedigree, right? People say, people say, who are you? I tell them my name. They go, oh, but who are you? I'm like, I just told you my name, right? What they're trying to do, they're trying to sniff out some pedigree, right? In other words, I want to assign some importance to you, but I need to know your title first. Paul said, you are a dog. Beware of people who are only looking for titles. Beware of people who only try to get you to force force you to sit under certain rules and regulations. Paul said there is freedom in Christ. Jesus, Jesus. Look at verse 8 again. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but and see the reason why God blesses you with things and stuff and education, it's so that you can forward the movement of the kingdom. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. Why? For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count all of that pedigree stuff as dung. Why? That I may win Christ. It's very interesting because he says, I have suffered the loss of all things. But if you look at the text, nowhere in the text does it says Paul was forced to do anything, right? When he had his encounter with God, he says, uh, why did God says, why do you kick against me? He says, yes, Lord. In other words, he acknowledged who he was right away, right? But he was not forced to do anything. But he says that all these things I have suffered loss. Oh. He has suffered this loss because he voluntarily gave up his own right to be right because he was wrong and aligned to the person who was right, which is the knowledge of oh Christ. Oh my gosh. Sometimes we have to give up our right to be right and recognize that we are wrong according to scripture. Look at verse nine. Oh. And be found in him, and be found in him. And be found in him means to be recognized in him, not having my own righteousness, mm -hmm. which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So when he says, uh, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, he's referring back to his Pharisaical upbringing, right? Remember, he was a Pharisee among the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were law-abiding, law-abiding, law law-keeping people, right? They, they loved the law of Moses. They lived by that law. Matter of fact, they loved it so much that they added more laws to it. So Paul is saying that uh, my righteousness was according to the law. But through faith in Jesus Christ, now my righteousness is in God through faith. Do you understand? There was an exchange there. There was, there was something that took place, right? So his righteousness was according to man. Yeah. But now that he has Christ, his righteousness is according to his faith in Christ. Paul's own righteousness was his religion. Mm -hmm. He had all his religious bills paid. Yet he was not right with God. Mm. I hear people say, but Oprah, what does it profit a man? This is what Dr. Grant Richardson says, and I really, I was like, <clears throat> when I read this, Christianity is not a matter of dropping old habits and acquiring new ones. Right. Becoming a Christian involves coming to God bankrupt of any self-righteousness and depending solely on Christ's righteousness. This growth series is challenging me. Like, is every, is, are you Jesus, Jesus? 
Are we really Jesus, everything Jesus? Is everything coming out Jesus? Yes. Is it all Jesus? Am I doing this for Jesus? Am I living this way for Jesus? Am I doing this thing for Jesus? Am I working here for Jesus? Am I loving my enemy for Jesus? Am I staying planted for Jesus? Is this all Jesus? Mm. That, I wonder. Or are we Jesus, Jesus over here, but over here, meh, you know, he knows my heart. Yes. It's wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Mm -hmm. And as we do this growth series, I'm like, God, the body of Christ is, is in bad shape. Yes, Lord. The Bible says that the, scarce, the, the righteous are scarcely saved. So I'm wondering, are we really Jesus, 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 Jesus? Or is it just G Sunday morning, Jesus, check. Monday morning, Jesus, hypocrisy. Tuesday morning, afternoon, lying. Thursday morning, fornication. Or are we just Jesus on Tuesday between 10 and not mm. preach too long because? So the first thing we need to realize in order for us to grow in 2020, we have to be found in him in him we have to be found in him not in our right. own ability not in our own righteousness we have to be found in him look at verse 10. here's the kicker he said all of this in verse 8 and in verse 9 that i may know him how and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. So Paul is saying that even though I was educated, even though I studied, you know, he, he can look at the disciples and say, I know more about the scriptures, about the law than you do. Yeah. He said, but one thing I do not have and I do not know, I do not know the power of his resurrection. We really say. He said, I know the law. And, and many of us, we don't have an issue with knowing what's right and what's wrong. But what we don't have is the power of God's resurrection living on the inside of us, right? That's, know, that, oh. that requires faith. Yes. To know means to learn to know or become to know a person. Mm -hmm. So if we take it back to school, if you want to know, if you want to make sure that you pass the test, you have to know the information that the teacher places on the test, right? Which means you have to do what? You have to study. And then she gives you, she says, we're going to have a quiz on Wednesday to, to gauge to make sure you know where you're at. The, the test is on Friday. Mm -hmm. So when you go to higher learning, they give you the end of the, of the semester testing, your midterms, to make sure that you know what was taught to you throughout that semester. And then you have your finals to make sure that you know all of everything. But the question is, are we, do we want to know Christ? Are, do we want to learn about him? Do we want to know the person yes. of who he is? Do we want to become acquainted and familiarize ourselves with his word? So that when the enemy comes in with a weapon, we can pull up on the inside of us what God said. Mm -hmm. So when the lie comes to our mind, we can pull up in us what God said. Whether or not you believe what the chemistry, what the biology teacher says, you better write down the right answer on that test if you want credit. Mm -hmm. If we do it for the educational system, my question is, why aren't we studying like that? Yes. For God, for Christ. Mm -hmm. Why? He says that I may know him, become intimate with him, mm -hmm. and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, when he says being conformed, he's letting us know that even though I'm writing you this letter from jail, even though I've said all these great things, I haven't arrived yet. I haven't arrived yet. He says, I am still being conformed. In other words, he's saying, I'm still growing. We're all still growing, but we can stunt our growth if we choose not to study, if we choose not to read, if we choose not to apply the principles that are laid out in the scriptures. Look at verse 11. Oh, if, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So he's looking forward to something that he can grow into. Look at verse 12. 
Not as though, I was, this just came to my mind. So on Thursdays, we go to the, to the jail and we teach in the morning to the women and then we teach in the afternoon to the men. And one of the pastors that I was teaching to, after we left the, left the men, he said, we can bring all these programs in here. We can teach them how to read and how to write. We can teach them their math. But if they don't have Jesus, they don't have anything. And he said, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. I was like, he said it with such passion. He was like, it was, it was as if he was saying, who cares if they r- learn all their timetables, but yes. they don't know Jesus? Like, like, who cares if they get out of here and get their GED and they don't have Jesus? This is why the world says the recidivism rate is so high. The recidivism rate is so high is because they do not learn Christ. Do you understand? They it's like this. They come in and they go out for one reason. There is no resurrection of the dead inside of their soul. Mm-hmm. And it's so important. We're not against education. We're not against being successful. We want you to have all those things, right? We want you to have Christ first the and then have those things, right? Or if you have achieved those things, we want you to bring Christ into that lifestyle, right? Look at verse 12. Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Let me read it again from the easy read. I don't mean that I am exactly what God wants me to be. Mm. I have not reached that goal, but I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. That's what Christ Jesus wants me to do. It is the reason he made me his. So if we look at this from the natural, he did attain all of those things when he was persecuting Christians. I mean, he was at the the top of his game, right? But now that he's on the other side, he says, I haven't done anything. I haven't achieved anything. All my achievement is dung. It's just a waste of time. Now I have to continue to press. And I like the word he says, I press. In other words, I yes. pressed so hard yes. when I wasn't in Christ. Yes. So why would I stop pressing now that I'm in Christ? Yes. One of the things I can't stand is lazy Christians. My Lord. Once we walk into the door, we say, I have arrived. Well, Paul said he hasn't arrived yet. So what makes you think we have arrived, right? We become lazy. We become spiritual lethargic. We don't want to do anything. We don't want to volunteer. We don't want to help. We don't want to pray. We just want to sit back like a baby with our mouth open saying, feed me. Lazy. Don't get mad at me. So if we look at it, the Bible says that we're supposed to walk worthy of the vocation in which we are called. Raise your hand or stand up if you can be hired for a job and not do what your job description says. So then why is it that when God says, let your light shine before men, that we feel like we don't have to operate in the job description? Mm. I don't understand that. It's to me, it's so selfish. God says, I have brought you in. Salvation is not the end of the game. Mm -hmm. Yes, we would like for you to start the job on Thursday. Can you be here at eight o'clock? Yes, I'll be here. That's not, that's not the end. You have to be trained and then you got to be put in your cubicle and then you go whatever it is. And so that you can carry on the work without somebody training you. So that's what we're supposed to do for Christ. But why is it Jesus that the body of Christ has become so sluggish? Like we are hired by Jesus Christ, the Messiah to do a job, but we don't do it because we don't have time. We have been given the main same mandate that is possible was given to go out and make disciples. Are you making a disciple? If, if, if we had to stand before God and everyone that we disciple stood behind us and he says, turn around and look who's behind you. Wouldn't it be a sad day if you turn around and there was no one standing behind you? In other words, you did not make not one disciple. We got 365 days of a growth message. Jesus, help us. Jesus, help us. I was listening to 
a song this morning. And the song was talking about, it's by Israel Houghton, and he was, his new album, and he was talking about growth. But he said the only way that we can grow is if we're able to bear up under the pain yes. of growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was like, growth causes a discomfort yes. and a transformation of the mind. Yes. And it is uncomfortable. Growth, when, when you're growing, it's like you easily want to go back to, one of, the, one of the ladies at the jail said, she said, y'all, we got to do right when we get up out of here because it's easy to go back to what's easy. She said, if we going to grow, we got to listen to what these people is telling us. That's what she said. And I was like, girl, you are, you are speaking the truth. It is easy to go back into what is comfortable. Yes. Pain is uncomfortable. Growth is uncomfortable. Yeah. We can't go back and do what we, I want to raise the dead. I want to speak to a tumor and it fall off. I want to prophesy to somebody that snatches them out of depression. That's the anointing I, and so God is like, you want that? Then you are setting yourself for crushing and growth. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Yes, ma'am. Let's go to, uh, stand in Philippians, go to Philippians 2.12. Because I, sometimes I think we think that once we're saved, we're done. I'm in. I'm going to heaven. Woohoo! I can sit back and just relax. Look at Philippians 2.12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. But salvation is a gift. It's a gift. Now that you receive the gift, it's time to go to work. Work it out. Work it out. It's going back to uh, chapter 3. 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Keep going. No. See, one of the things that Paul is highlighting here is that once you become saved, there's two things that you have to forget. You have to forget your non-Christian past, but you also have to forget your believing Christians' accomplishments. Let me explain so that. quiet in here. Mm. You have to forget your non-Christian past. In other words, everything that you did prior to your salvation, uh, forget about it. Don't let the enemy use that as a weapon against you. But also, once you were saved, once you, con once you were converted, you have to forget your current, your, your, your current Christian accomplishments because if you don't, you will stay right there. Yes. It is so disheartening to hear people always talk about what, what church did. used to be like, what we used to do in church, what God did for us in the past. In other words, Paul is saying both of those occasions, you are living in the past. And that's not working out your salvation. Yeah, your accomplishments in Christ were great, but Ooh. keep pressing toward the mark. One of the, one, of the, one of the worst things that God can give us sometimes is a victory is a blessing because as soon as we get it we stop we're done i pray for this financial blessing i have it now i'm done i pray to open up this home to help people i've done it now i'm done we we, we i pray for a church family and i can learn and grow now that i'm here i'm just going to sit back and be done no paul said we still have to press because either way you will become lethargic if you just sit there and think about your past life before Christ, and if you sit there and think about your salvation story over and over and over again and do nothing about it. Read verse oh 13 my gosh. again. Brethren, you can put your name there. I count not myself to have apprehended or to have arrived, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So here's Paul sitting in jail. Sitting in jail. <laughs> he is literally mm -hmm. sitting in jail writing a letter of encouragement to the church telling them, I'm looking forward to the things which are ahead. Yeah. You're in jail. He says, so what? 
if I, if I worry about where I am right now, then I will never reach forward. I will never press forward. I don't care if I'm in jail. I don't care about the current situation I find myself in right now. If I stop dreaming, if I stop hoping, if I stop pressing, I will never reach to my goal. So Paul is saying that I'm going to keep on trying and keep on trying and keep on trying. Do not let your current situation define you. Brothers and sisters, I know that I still have a long way to go, mm -hmm. but there is one thing I do. I forget what is in the past and try as hard as I can to reach the goal before me. I keep running hard towards the finish line to get the prize that is mine because God has called me through Christ Jesus to life up there in heaven. The ultimate prize is a life with Christ in heaven. Once we're saved, our name is written in this Lamb book of life. We are saved. We are going to be with Christ in heaven. However, if we say that's the end of our race, then the next 50, 60, 100 years that we spend on earth will be just a waste of time. If the intention was just to get us to heaven, then the moment we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the Savior of our life, we should drop dead right there on the spot. If that's the For intention. Real. Really, For think real. about it. If your intention is just to go to heaven to be with Christ, once you confess him as Lord over your life, he should just take you home right then and there. No, but you're here because there's work for you to do. You're here because you still have a pressing that you have to press your way into. The worst thing that we could do is forget our press, to lose our zeal, to lose our drive, to let our light burn out. Once the salt has lost its how again, how again will it be salted? How do you get your flavor back? How do you get it back? Look at verse 15. I want to, I want to, so I was like looking online for a good picture of pressing towards the pressing towards. I found this picture. It says, this is what the, 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 the front of the article said. It says, no, not that one. Go to the one before that. N -n -n -n. It's 13, slide number 13. This is what, this is what it said. Fighting finish. Brave Brit runner Haley Caruthers collapses and crawls across finish line at the London Marathon mm. before medics rush to her, her aid. Brit put her all into breaking a new personal best, but paid the price at the end when she collapsed. And so this is the picture of this woman. She's beating her personal best. Like she could have really stopped running and she could have just walked because do you, there's nobody behind her. She was like 30 minutes into her personal best. She was like, I have, now this is, this is worldly, this is secular. Mm -hmm. She says, I have, I'm running a marathon. I have to make it towards what? The finish line. So she's running and she has nothing else inside of her to give. So she says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it. Yes. So she gets on her hands and knees and crawls across the finish line. Mm. And I was gonna put up another video. I was gonna put up a one minute and something something video of this woman who was in the exact same situation. And she was running towards the finish line and there was somebody that was running towards her. And she was running but she collapsed. And she got up and she, it was like she was a drunk. Paul says, you gotta run towards the finish line. She was running like this. And she fell and she'd crawl a little and then she would get up and she would fall and the finish line was right there. Then somebody stopped and was helping her. She went like this. I got it. And, she, and the lady was like this and she fell across the finish line. She was up, y'all. She wasn't crawling. She was like this in a drunken stupor and she fell and then they came and put her in a, in a wheelchair and she went and they just, and they said, she's going to be okay. She just needs to be hydrated. She just needs to be given some food. Mm. And then I thought to myself, when we're being beaten up and beaten down by the devil, sometimes we feel like we got to crawl across the finish line. Yes. We got to pull ourselves. The army crawl. 
across the finish line. I wonder if some of us will be like, mm, forget it, that's just too much. I, I just can't do it. It doesn't take all of that. But it does take all of that. I'm going to read it again. My brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Yes, they did you wrong. Mm. Who cares? Move it along. And reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now put yes. the other picture up there. And so I asked myself this question when I was putting this together. Mm -hmm. Where's the finish line? Because I can't see it. Right. Keep going. You'll eventually see it. Mm -hmm. The mark is in the distance. Yes. He says, I press towards the mark. Where's the mark? The mark is in the distance. The mark is looked at. It is the goal or end in one's view. I don't, can you imagine running? Where's the finish line? I don't see it. It doesn't matter. If you keep going, eventually you'll see it. Mm -hmm. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. Look at verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be mature. That word perfect means mature. Let us, therefore, as many as be mature, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So God says, let this mind be in you. And if this mind is not in you, we pray that God will reveal to you what's holding you up, what's stopping you from pressing, what's stopping you from moving forward, right? Let this mind be in you. In the easy read, it says, all of us who have grown to be spiritually mature should think this way too. And if there is any of this, and if there is any of this that you don't agree with, mm. if you don't agree with the word of God, if you don't agree with the wisdom, the instruction, the correction, the rebuke that people give to you, that the Holy Spirit gives to you. And if there is any of this that you don't agree with, God will make it clear to you. Mm -hmm. But we should continue following the truth we already have. We should continue. There's the conviction that Paul received came directly from God. And I've heard many people say that I'll change my life when I hear the conviction from God. Well, again, you do not want God, you don't want to have that Damascus Road experience that Paul had, right? I mean, we say we want that, but if we really think about it, God speaks to us. He's speaking to us right now from across the pulpit. He's convicting us with his word right now. He's convicting us right now that we need a press in our life. Again, I say, we know when we're giving something our all. And we know when we're just going through the emotions, right? When it comes to Christianity, uh, our religion is a religion that does, not, does not require us to give up our life, so to speak, right? Our religion requires us to dedicate our life to Christ. But other religions require them to even sacrifice their own life to prove their devotion to God. But we serve a king that proved his devotion to us by sacrificing his life for us that we may live. So my question is, because of the life that Christ has already sacrificed for yours, are you living a life worth the sacrifice? Are you truly pressing? Are you moving toward the mark? Look at verse 16. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, I love this right here, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them or observe them which walk so that which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. In other words, imitate the ones who are convicted by the word of God. He's basically saying there's no excuse for those of us who call ourselves the called out ones. There is no excuse not to move forward. As I told you last week, there is no neutral gear in God. There is no neutral gear in Christianity. Either you are going forward or you're going in reverse. 
There is no place where you say, I'm just going to maintain. No, you're always pressing. You're always moving. We had an apostle, Alex, that came through, a uh, Hispanic pastor, and he says that God requires movement, movement. We should constantly be moving in Christ. Not only should we be moving, but we should be making disciples Come as we on, go. God. Making Ooh. disciples as we go. Look at this last slide. This blew my mind. In Greece, there was no second place. In Greece, in the games, there was no second place. You either won or you didn't. You either got to the mark or you did not. Winners were given a laurel wreath for their head and a pot containing olive oil. Winners were called Olympionics. In Greece, there was no second place. You either won or you didn't. Either you press towards the mark and you get in or you don't. Mm. There is no purgatory. There is no middle place. He says in his word in, with the church of Laodicea, he says there's not, there's not supposed to be a lukewarm. Right. Either you're hot That's right. or you're cold. Either you finish or you don't. Either he says well done or he doesn't. Mm. Either you're saved or you're not. Right. Either you're moving or you're stagnant. When water stops moving, what happens? It begins to stink. Oh, man. When your blood stops moving, what mm. happens? It means that there is death. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so if there is no movement, blood and water ran from his side. Right. I, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will sustain Pastor Gary and I, Holy Spirit, yes, as we teach yes, growth yes, for the entire year. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will not be weary in well-doing, mm -hmm. but I pray that you will fan the flame of the hearers, that true salvation will come forth, that working in the kingdom will come forth. I hear the Lord saying, many of us have made it out of Sodom and Gomorrah, yes. but you have turned around and you have become stagnant, but my grace is sufficient. Put your hands to the plow and keep pressing. Let me goad you. Let me disciple you. I pray in the name of Jesus that the real church of the living God of the Ecclesia yes. will stand up. I declare and decree in the name of Jesus that we will not be hungry and thirsty for zeal without knowledge, but we will be sober minded to understand the doctrine of the word of God and go forth as true disciples into all the generations yes, that, that we'll go to the north, the south, the east and the West. It is over for zeal without knowledge. That will cause us to be dead. I pray in the name of Jesus that the word will pierce and conform the hearts, transform the minds to your image. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So to give you these uh, points real quick as we look at the lesson of Paul, uh, one of the things that we can learn from Paul that stops us from reaching our mark is, number one, is our past our non-Christian life. Dwelling on the things that we did before Christ will keep us from reaching our mark. Not forgiving people of the sins that they committed against us will keep us from reaching our mark. My Lord. My Lord. Also, resting on current success. Even in your Christian life, if you decide that you have arrived, that you have attained, if you rest on your current success, it will keep you from growing. It will keep you from pressing toward the mark. Gosh, man. Forgiving others. Forgive people. Remember, when you don't forgive people, uh, you're not holding them in bondage. You're holding yourself in bondage. You're holding yourself to that past event. It's like you take a chain and you put it around your own ankle. And you're saying that I'm not leaving this pain. I'm not leaving this hurt. I'm not leaving this event. I'm not leaving this trauma. So we chain ourselves to it. And we can't reach our mark. So don't rest. Don't look at your past. Don't have unforgiveness in your heart. Forgive others. Press toward the mark. And don't rest on your current success. Did you enjoy this lesson today?
We declare and 